Well, thank you all for coming <laughs> this evening. Um, this is a program organized by Recursos de Santa Fe with the generous help of many friends. Recursos is a local not-for-profit. This summer's opera production of Dr. Atomic has occasioned many discussions and exhibits, and it seemed an appropriate time to look at what happened in the aftermath of the Manhattan Project, and in particular, what happened to its most famous person, J. Robert Oppenheimer. And special thanks to Summers Carnes and Associates for sponsoring one of our speakers, and many, many, many thanks to La Fonda, who have provided this room and the extra chairs, and the AV, and so many other things. La Fonda has a special connection uh, with the story that we're telling tonight. Perhaps one of the best books on this, what sort of word would we use, topic, uh, is Priscilla McMillan's The Ruin of J. Robert Oppenheimer, which is dedicated to Sam and Ethel Ballin, the former owners of this hotel, who had an abiding interest in the Manhattan Project. The question of what happened in the matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer has haunted us for many years. It has been the subject of plays, TV documentaries, books, and haunted the men who were directly and indirectly involved. Here, for the first time, you will hear this story from beginning to end, everything that we know right now, which is a little different than what different versions came out. This is a complicated story, and it's a very good fortune that we have so many distinguished experts on this story living here in Santa Fe, and they have agreed to be a part of this panel. You all have a sheet with their biographies, and they will speak. Uh, first, Valerie Plame will read a very short summary of the hearing. And then Greg Kirkin will talk about the 1930s Harkon Chevalier. And then Julie Melton, whose father was a good friend of Oppenheimer's. And then John Earl Haynes, who will talk about what the Soviet decrypts said about Oppenheimer. And then finally, we will hear Jim Fitzpatrick to bring us up to the present, uh, what has been done and maybe there isn't more to do. Anyway, and Valerie Plame will moderate and she is pretty tough. So if you can hold your comments and questions till the end, thank you. Hi, good evening, I'm Valerie Plame. Thank you all for coming. Uh, standing room only, uh, who knew Robert Oppenheimer would be so popular, but uh, I'm glad you're here this evening. I, I can't wait to hear what our experts are going to speak about. I'm going to give you a very brief background, uh, what you might know about Robert Oppenheimer, uh, father of the Manhattan Project, up the hill, danced and drank here at La Fonda, uh, but his story is complex and, uh, and has relevance to today, which is I'm so thankful to Ellen for putting this on and organizing this. Think about where his story and where those dots connect today. Um, the background that I'm going to give you to lay the table, as it were, you'll hear a couple names and a couple references to maybe things that you don't readily know. Don't worry, it will be explained by our experts. So the hearing began on April 12th, 1954, in a temporary building off of Constitution Avenue, close to the White House. It took place in an office converted into a makeshift courtroom. It wasn't clear to, to the defense by which rules the court was playing, whether it was a hearing or whether it was a trial. The defense suffered from a lack of access because they had none of Oppenheimer's, none of Oppenheimer's defense team had a security clearance, and therefore they could not see pivotal documents, including information from Oppenheimer's FBI file and some of his own writings that the prosecution had access to. Oppenheimer served as the defense's memory, but frequently censored himself out of a fear of unintentionally spilling classified information. Already a high-profile affair, 
the atmospherics became more pitched through the self-insertion of Senator Joe Joseph McCarthy. Drew Pearson, he was an important columnist who pricked up his ears when he heard of the Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer hearings. He realized that the Oppenheimer trail was big news and he turned his attention to it. His was an important voice. Pearson was noted for his syndicated newspaper column, Washington Merry-Go-Round, in which he criticized various public persons. He had astonishing clout in his day. Indeed, Joe Senator Joseph McCarthy's involvement and the trial's placement in the public spotlight changed its nature dramatically. No longer was the hearing simply about Oppenheimer's loyalty. Now the entire role of scientists in politics and the standards to which they were to be held was being examined. As Pearson's column suggested, Commissioner Strauss came to regret having stirred up this particular hornet's nest, worrying that his actions might alternate, excuse me, alienate the scientists who were central to his success as the Atomic Energy Commission chairman. Strauss had a grudge against Oppenheimer and was the motivating factor in the sham hearings that resulted in Oppenheimer's loss of clearance. Furthermore, Strauss's hearing likely played into McCarthy's hands by creating an opportunity for him to get involved in the debate. McCarthy had wanted to go after Oppenheimer long before, but he had refused primarily because his record uh, had already been cleared in 1947. However, with the trial opened by a different party, McCarthy could now talk more freely about suspected spies in the atomic bomb program. If he was challenged, he only needed to mention Oppenheimer's suspension as evidence for his point of view. Further challenging the defense, was the fact that the prosecution had access to wiretap recordings of their conversations. Before, during, and after the hearings, Strauss or the prosecuting attorney, Roger Robb, read at least 273 wiretapped reports, including communications between Oppenheimer and his attorneys and within the entire defense team. The hearings began with Oppenheimer on the stand answering Garrison's questions about his professional conduct and years of service. He was then cross-examined by Rob, who grilled him on the Chevalier affair. Oppenheimer testified for a total of 27 hours across several days, growing increasingly weary from Rob's pointed questioning. Oppenheimer's testimony was interspersed with statements from others. General Groves then retired affirmed his choice to hire Oppenheimer and place him in charge of Los Alamos and said that he would be amazed if Oppenheimer had ever been disloyal. Edward Teller testified against Oppenheimer and when asked if he believed Oppenheimer to be a security risk, he responded, in a great number of cases I have seen Dr. Oppenheimer act, I understand that Dr. Oppenheimer acted in a way that was for me exceedingly hard to understand. I thoroughly disagreed with him in numerous issues and his actions frankly appeared to me confused and complicated. To this extent, I feel I would like to see the vital interests of this country in hands which I understand better and therefore trust more. For this testimony, Teller was actively rejected and shunned by much of the scientific community for many years. At the end of the hearing, Oppenheimer's clearance was revoked by a two to one vote of the panel. It assented to 20 of the 24 charges. It affirmed that Oppenheimer was associated with a number of the communist activities, but also concluded he was a loyal citizen who had practiced a great deal of circumspection. However, it ex objected strongly to the Chevalier incident. No person with such associations, they said, could be trusted with security clearance. Oppenheimer lost his clearance less than 24 hours before his contract was up and his clearance was to lapse anyway. So that lays the groundwork, some basic facts for you 
And next up, we will have Mr. Greg Herkin, and he will speak about the Chevalier incident. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Well, uh, I'm going to just do this pretty briefly, and I have some slides to show. The first one I wanted to show was actually one of my favorites. It, it's uh, Robert Oppenheimer's badge photo uh, in April 1943, uh, when he just begins taking over the project. And I like it because you already see the haunted look in his eyes, I think. He's beginning to realize what he's uh, gotten into. And uh, Hocan Chevalier was mentioned. Hocan Chevalier was a good friend of Robert Oppenheimer's. Hocan was a uh, uh, professor of French literature at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he had been a longtime friend of, of Oppenheimer's. They were good social friends. And they saw pretty much eye to eye politically as well. Uh, Chevalier described himself as a man of the left. And uh, uh, so, was, so was Oppenheimer. We know that uh, the Soviet Union was interested, knew about, and was interested in the bomb project and wanted to find out more about what was going on uh, at various places in America where uh, bomb-related re bomb research was being conducted. And we know that because this is actually a Soviet document. Enormous was the, uh, the Soviet code word for the American bomb project, uh, and it was an apt one because they knew at that what, what scale this project would be to produce a weapon like an atomic bomb. So th what the, this is, if this, I can get the cursor to work here, this was actually a wish list that was given to the KGB, to Soviet intelligence, of the targets that the KGB, that Soviet spies, uh, should, uh, should look for uh, in America. Uh, and uh, you can see here, the very first target is the radiation laboratory at, uh, at Berkeley. And that's, not, that's partly because of Oppenheimer, but even more because of Ernest Lawrence. Lawrence was perfecting the machines that would be called the calutrons. And the calutrons were the spectrographs that would separate uranium. Uh, all the uranium that was uh, produced for the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima went through the calutrons that, uh, ro that uh, uh, Ernest Lawrence invented. So it was not only Oppenheimer, but, uh, but Lawrence was a target here. Oh, and, and just a couple of things. This, is, uh, and this document became available after the collapse of the Soviet Union. John Haynes can talk a bit about how the Soviet archives, including KGB records, opened up, at least for a brief time, uh, after that collapse. And this, as I say, was the wish list. Uh, the KGB asked the head, the scientific head of the Soviet bomb project, Igor Karchatov, whose name is right here, uh, for a list of targets. Where to, where to find the secrets in America. Uh, and you'll notice the date, which may be significant. It's March uh, 22nd, 1943. Well, another friend of Robert Oppenheimer was this man, Steve Nelson. Uh, in fact, actually, Steve was a good friend of Kitty's as well, even before Robert married uh, Kitty. Steve Nelson was, uh, in fact, the head of the Communist Party in Alameda County uh, during this period in 1943. And a good social friend, that's one of, the, as was referenced, that's one of the reasons that Oppenheimer came under suspicion was because of his associations and uh, associations with people like Steve Nelson. And we now know that Steve Nelson was contacted by Soviet intelligence officials uh, at this time in 1943 and asked to find out more about what's going on at Berkeley, up the so-called the project on the hill, uh, and to report back what he can find out. Well, there's a reference to wiretaps. Um, there was a division of labor here uh, that the, uh, the FBI took responsibility for surveilling uh, people they knew to be or suspected to be rank and file communists. And since uh, Steve Nelson was known to be head of the Communist Party of Alameda County, he was an immediate target. So they placed a wiretap uh, in his apartment. And in those days, this, this, basically what they did is they had somebody who was disguised as a telephone repairman would go in and basically uh, arrange, rewire your telephone so that the receiver 
would become a microphone and it would pick up any voices, uh, any discussion within range. And that's exactly what they did to Steve Nelson. So uh, the FBI is monitoring this. This is an actual transcript of, with comments by the FBI agents. Uh, late on the evening of uh, March 29th, the week, just perhaps coincidentally, a week after that uh, memo by uh, Igor uh, Kurchatov, um, there is a discussion that occurs between an individual known as Joe. Joe comes to Steve Nelson's uh, house late at night. He's not, Steve is not there, actually. He was at a party meeting, it turned out. He doesn't get home till about 11 o'clock. Joe said, tells Steve's wife, I'll just wait. Uh, Joe tells Steve Nelson that he is a scientist who's working on the project up on the hill and that he is also a man of the left and that he wants to help out the comrades. Again, this is a time, this is a time of uh, Stalingrad. Uh, so that Joe says, uh, he starts to describe the project itself. And he, I don't know if you can, how well you can see the transcript here, but he mentions uranium, spectrograph. Uh, uh, basically, he begins to describe it, what's going on up at the hill. Steve Nelson's not a technical guy. He doesn't really understand this. So he says, well, Joe, write it down and I'll pass it along to the comrades. Well, the FBI doesn't even know about the bomb project at this point. So they don't know what to make of this, but they know that the project up on the hill is actually the, under the authority of the US Army. So the FBI contacts this man, uh, Boris Pash, who was the head of count the counterintelligence corps for the Western Division of the United States. And Boris Pash, uh, I could tell you a lot about Boris Pash, but I think you can see from this expression that he was a serious guy and uh, that he was intent upon finding out uh, who this Joe was. Well, uh, Pash immediately goes to his superior. Pash hits the roof, goes to his superior, General Groves, and uh, head of the, of, the, of the project, really, and tells uh, Groves that in Berkeley there is somebody who is passing information on to the Russians, and, and to Steve Nelson in particular. So the search, the, uh, immediately it's an all points bulletin that you know, the search is on for Joe. And uh, Joe, it turns out, if I can find, is Joe Weinberg, uh, who was one of Oppenheimer's graduate students. And these are all four graduate students of Oppenheimer's, Joe Weinberg, Rossi Lomenitz, David Bohm, and Max Friedman. And this picture was taken actually uh, outside Sather Gate, the entrance to the Berkeley campus, by a Fox, uh, I was gonna say Fox News photographer. No, 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 <laughs> sorry, Fox photo photographer who was stationed out there permanently to take pictures of any students who want their picture taken. Well, he was undercover as that age, uh, as this Fox uh, photo guy, but he was actually a, a, a counterintelligence agent for the Army. And so he took the picture. I think Rossi Lomanetz wanted the picture of he and his buddies taken. Uh, he gave the, uh, you know, he sent the picture to Rossi, but he kept the negative. He gave the negative to uh, Boris Pash. So, um, so these, so Joe has been identified, uh, but all four of these uh, graduate students who were involved with the bomb project in some capacity are suddenly under suspicion. And in fact, actually, it's not, un it's not unfair or inaccurate to say that their careers as scientists were ruined uh, by this one incident, by this photograph. Uh, they were all removed from the project by the direct order of General Groves after this. Well, um, word gets back uh, to Oppenheimer, who's at, at Los Anos by this time that his graduate students uh, have been fired from the project. Uh, you know, they, they, they tell him, like, you know, we can't get work. We were all set, you know, ready to go to Oak Ridge or Los Alamos. And suddenly the orders of, you know, we're, we, you know we, we can't do that anymore. What's the story? So Oppenheimer hears of this. He goes back to Berkeley, and he decides that he should tell Pash something about what he knows. So he, he goes into Boris Pash's office in, uh, in an office at Berkeley. And, um, and says, well, you know, there, there actually is espionage. There was an attempt made by the Russians to steal secrets about the bomb. And there was an unnamed, inter uh, unnamed intermediary, that is, I will not name who that is, somebody I know, who approached three different scientists in working with the project and asked them if they would pass information to the Russians. And I know this because each of these scientists came to me within a week and said, what should I do? And I told them an, 
I, Oppenheimer, told them in no uncertain terms, do not cooperate, and, uh, and that'll be the end of it. And I will also tell this unnamed intermediary, do not cooperate. Well, Pash naturally asks, who were the three scientists, and, and Oppenheimer doesn't say. Uh, who is the unnamed intermediary? Oppenheimer doesn't say. Um, Pash and John Lansdale, who is head of security for the Manhattan Project, Groves themselves, all the, basically go back to Oppenheimer, who were the three that were contacted. Groves finally believes that the three must have been Joe Weinberg, Rossi Lomenitz, Max Friedman, and or, you know, some combination of those four. They are shunted off. They are taken out of the bomb project, so that threat of espionage against the project has been dealt with, has been removed. Okay, well, time goes on. The war ends, um, and the whole issue of security and espionage is, gone, is, is given over from the Army to the FBI. The FBI wants to know who the scientists are, who is the unnamed intermediary, who by this time Groves has actually asked Oppenheimer, has ordered Oppenheimer to tell him, and Oppenheimer says it was Hocan Chevalier who was suspected. Uh, but Oppenheimer, in 1946, is interviewed by the FBI, and he tells a different story. Uh, he says that, well, actually, what I told before wasn't true, that uh, there was only one person approached by Chevalier, and that was me, and I said I would not cooperate, and that was the end of it. Well, the problem here is that uh, Oppenheimer didn't know that his conversation with Pash had been recorded. He had told two very different versions of the Chevalier incident, and, and uh, one of them had to be a lie. They both couldn't be true. Either Chevalier approached three scientists, or he approached one scientist, uh, Oppenheimer. So this was the climactic moment that was referred to, actually, in the, uh, in the hearing, where uh, the, the recording, basically, that Pash made of, uh, back in 1943 of his interview with Oppenheimer is played back, and uh, they are... Um, and Pash is on the stand here, and basically he says, he indicated three definite approaches that were made. Any question in your mind? No, sir. Um, and, uh, yeah, so. So then the FBI interview was, was introduced, and Oppenheimer had said no, that only one person had been approached, and that was himself. And so uh, this is Roger Robb cross-examining Oppenheimer. Didn't you say that X, Chevalier, had approached three people? Uh, probably. Why did you do that, doctor? Because I was an idiot. Uh, well, you know, here, this is, you know, this is Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, and it basically does not have a good justification or reason or excuse for why he lied to a government official about an espionage conspiracy in wartime, which is a crime, uh, which is a felony. So, given this evidence, how can you possibly give a top security clearance, top secret clearance, to a man who admits that he lied to government officials about a, an espionage conspiracy? Um, and actually, I'll just add these. This is, this is the, sort of the Oppenheimer out at pasture picture that I've, I've uh, I put here, that his Oppenheimer's influence uh, was uh, terminated in government once he uh, lost his security clearance. And instead, actually, it, uh, who, who took over that role was Edward Teller, who, of course, had testified against Oppenheimer and had, as, as many of Oppenheimer's defenders said, stabbed Robert in the back and twisted the knife. Uh, and this is uh, about the, one of the last pictures of Oppenheimer. This was at the Princeton commencement in 1966. He was then dying of throat cancer, and he was, I think, dead a few, a few months later. Okay, so um, <laughs> one issue we haven't talked about here, uh, and we were going to talk about initially, is the question, uh, was Robert Oppenheimer a communist? Was he a Soviet agent? Both have been alleged. Um, I can give you the short answer here, but I think I'll just leave it open for maybe uh, questions and discussion later. But um, I think uh, Julie um, Milton would like to speak about her father, David Hawkins, who is a personal assistant to Robert Oppenheimer uh, at Los Alamos. 
Meg and I have been on the phone quite a bit in the last week or so. It's been, I think, the most interesting thing that has happened in preparation for this talk. Because we were trying to sort of work out some differences, let me put it that way. Um, not so much opinion as facts, what happened. My father, David Hawkins, was a philosophy graduate student at Berkeley who took uh, Robert Oppenheimer's courses on physics, several of them, because his field was philosophy of science. And he told me once that Oppenheimer was such an inspired teacher that his students would stay up all night studying because they couldn't bear not to know something that he would ask them the next day. Uh, that's just a little background. I think one of Oppenheimer's great strengths was as a teacher. Um, my father went to Los Alamos in 1943 as Oppenheimer's personal assistant. And later during, maybe a year later, he was given a new assignment, which was to write the official history of the wartime years of Los Alamos, which, is, which was declassified some 25 or 30 years ago. Now I want to return briefly to my parents. My father and my mother joined the Communist Party in California in, I think, 1936. I'm not sure of that. Uh, at the time, they told me that it seemed to be the only voice against fascism and the only voice against the terrible events that were going on in California where Oki's tent settlements were being burned to the ground by vigilantes uh, and the police did not intervene. Um, there was a lot of violence and racism in California at that time. And as they said to me when, from the time I was growing up, no one opposed it except the communists. They were the only ones. So that was kind of the motivating factor. However, once my parents got in and my mother wasn't very active, my father started writing articles for lo the local communist paper and he almost immediately got in trouble with Earl Browder who was the national chairman of the Communist Party, which at that time was quite big. It was several million people. And he got in trouble because he wrote a piece about the different types of peasantry in Russia. Uh, and by implication, he was being critical of what has been called since, if you've studied Soviet history or politics, the liquidation of the kulaks. By implication, he was saying, not all the peasantry are reactionary or, you know, the middle peasantry was just fine, and he quoted Lenin, moreover, to buttress his argument. So that got him into some trouble. That was sort of the first sign of trouble. Um, then in 1939, as you know, there was a Nazi-Soviet pact, which my father always said kind of bought time for the Soviet Union. Some people quit the Communist Party in 1939, particularly in California, because of that. My father actually quit a few months later in 1940 because when the Nazis invaded the Low Countries, Belgium and Netherlands, the, Netherlands, the local communists in Belgium and the Netherlands collaborated with the Nazis. And for my father, that was the definitive thing that he said to my mother, we have to quit, this is crazy. And they did in 1940. So all of this occurred before the events that Greg is talking about. Um, my father was always very open about his own past, but he refused to give the names of anyone else when he was called before two congressional committees in the 1950s. The first time he was called was the Un-American Activities Committee. And that was in 1950. And then he was called later by the Jenner Committee in the Senate in 1953, I believe it was. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But uh, here, at this point, I think the relevant point is that he always consistently, to me, declared that Oppenheimer, although he, my father, had been a Communist Party member, Oppenheimer was not. In other words, although he wouldn't give names, he, he, he would say things like, but Oppenheimer definitely was not a communist. And given Greg's findings, and it appears to me that from what Greg has described, is that Oppenheimer was a member of a closed, and by definition, secret cell designed to protect reputations. 
designed to keep the membership secret, in other words. And my parents were younger. They were just in their 20s at that point. They were in a communist cell, but it was a public cell. It was open. Everybody knew who was in it at the time. And they apparently, and both of my parents believed that although Oppenheimer was sympathetic to Loyalist Spain and gave money for Loyalist Spain, that he had never actually been a party member. And I don't find this incongruity at all hard to accept because if something is secret, it's secret from other Communist Party members as well. And that's, that's my particularly junior party members like my parents. Um, Greg and I talked on the phone about this and we agreed this is the most probable explanation for the discrepancy. Also, my father and mother quit in 1940 before Oppenheimer, uh, before the events in question, as I mentioned, two or three years before. Um, okay, fast forward to 1950. I was nine years old, and I still remember the fear in the pit of my stomach when my father and mother sat me down and they said, Daddy may go to jail. And the reason for that was he did not take the Fifth Amendment because he believed that if he did, he could not really talk about what had happened. As he said to me once, I couldn't tell them why I joined or why I quit. And I remember saying to him, but you quit. Why are they punishing you? You didn't like it. You got out. He said, that doesn't matter. That's not what this is about. And I remember this very clearly. He said, they're not really after me. They're after Oppenheimer. Uh, and that's one of my very vivid memories of that period. And he used the First Amendment, freedom of speech, et cetera, as a major reason why he had quit the Communist Party because they didn't have freedom of speech in the Communist Party. And he, then he said, and you, congressman, are threatening the very same right, the freedom of speech. That's why I quit, and that's why I will talk to you about myself. It's my freedom of speech, why I quit, why I, why I joined, why I quit, but I won't talk about anyone else. His lawyer said, David, you're going to go to jail for this. You're going to be cited for contempt of Congress. And that's when my parents sat me down and warned me about this. But rather than cite him for contempt, HUAC backed down which is one of the most amazing things about this whole story, I think, which didn't occur with Oppenheimer's hearing, sadly, but that happened with my father, and my father was not fired at the University of Colorado. He was one of the very few people at that time who wasn't. He was very lucky that way. He was called again by the Jenner Committee in 52-53 while he was a visiting professor at Harvard. Probably, and I'm sure of this, in fact, they were looking for more evidence against Oppenheimer since my father had been his personal assistant. But I remember my father being less frightened and more relaxed and confident than he had been in 1950. Given the results, however, of the Oppenheimer hearings, it seems that the political fever had not broken when my father testified for the second time, even though it was a little easier for him. It really took the McCarthy army hearings in 1954 to achieve that. Valerie mentioned something about the dots connecting. And I thought of my conclusion. I want to compare briefly three periods in American history, in recent American history. The first period was the 1930s, when it appeared to many young people that only the Communist Party, as I said, was standing up to fascism in Europe and political violence in the United States. The second period was the 1950s when it was public opinion that finally checked the excesses of the McCarthy era. As I said, with the McCarthy army hearing, that was really a key turning point. And the third period, of course, we're living in right now. Uh, public opinion, sadly, today is more polarized and frozen than it was in the 1950s. There was a huge shift of opinion against the hearings in the 50s. And I have many personal stories testifying to neighbors who were Republicans who shifted their opinion, who said things like, well, if they can call people like you, there must be something wrong with these hearings. Um, 
But there is one advantage that we have today over both of the previous periods, particularly both over the 1930s, and that is that we have a virtual rainforest of diverse organizations fighting to strengthen and preserve our democracy. One measure, Congressional Races Alone, which I'm involved in now as a volunteer, I just want to mention this, there are at least 20 or more national organizations supporting congressional candidates, two of which are bipartisan or postpartisan, three are veterans groups, there's an LGBT group, a Latino group, and one, 314, supports scientists running for office. And they just won an election yesterday, in fact, uh, in Michigan. Um, others are more, general, more generally support progressives, Justice Democrats, Indivisible, brand new Congress. And most of these are new. They're really just in the last year or so, except for Emily's List, which has been around for a while. So I thought I would close with that, um, those three periods in recent history. Thank you. John Haynes is going to talk about the Venona documents and uh, the Venona KGB documents. Excuse me. The Oppenheimer matter did not fade away after the EC's action in 1954. The issue became a long-standing historical tr controversy with journalists, commentators, and historians addressing the issue repeatedly in the decades that followed. To many commentators, the Oppenheimer case, along with Audrey Hess and Julius Rosenberg cases, demonstrated that concern about domestic communism and Soviet espionage in the late 1940s and 50s was a paranoid obsession with little factual basis. On the other side, there were those who took a where there's smoke, there's fire, and thought it was only a matter of time before Oppenheimer's espionage became clear. But while the emotional level of the debate continued, the substance became increasingly stale. In the next 40 years, there was little new evidence. Since the 1990s, however, New evidence has emerged that while not resolving all amb ambiguities, nonetheless allow confident answers to the question of whether Robert Oppenheimer was a communist or whether he was a spy. Let me examine first the new evidence regarding whether J. Robert Oppenheimer participated in Soviet espionage. In 1995, the National Security Agency, um, America's chief cryptographic agency, release the Venona decryptions. These were decryptions of around 3,000 Soviet cables that had been sent between 1943 and 1946 between Soviet intelligence stations abroad and their headquarters in Moscow. Uh, these messages were decrypted from 1946 uh, into the 1960s and finally released in 1995. A number of these decoded cables dealt with atomic espionage, particularly that of Klaus Fuchs, Julius Rosenberg, David Greenglass, Harry Gold, and Ted Hall. There was, however, very little about Robert Oppenheimer. His name appears in one 1944 message and one 1945 message in clear text, no code name. Uh, but these were messages where various Soviet sources reported on scientists involved in, in the Manhattan Project. Those were reports about him from Soviet spies, not reports from him. None suggested any compromised relationship with Soviet intelligence. Two 1945 Venona messages contain the code name Vexel, whom Venona analysts identified as probably Robert Oppenheimer. These mentions were also benign or ambiguous. In any event, KGB archival documents recorded in Alexander Vasiliev's notebooks made it clear this was one of the few cases where Venona analysts aired in an, an identification. Vexel was not Robert Oppenheimer. Vexel was Enrico Fermi. Those who thought Oppenheimer guilty of espionage, and I assure you there are many of those, 
Haber argued that the absence of damning Venota messages about Oppenheimer could simply be the product of NSA only being able to decode a small portion of KGB message traffic. That point is valid. But in, 19, in, in 2009, Alexander Vasilius's notebooks were made public. They contained 1,165 pages of abstracts, summaries, and quotations from KGB archival records of Soviet espionage in the United States in the 1930s and 40s. Included were dozens of KGB archival documents about Robert Oppenheimer. The earliest reference in the notebooks is a 7 December 1942 cable from San Francisco KGB station chief Gregory Heifetz reporting that Alfred Marshak, a geneticist at the University of California, Berkeley, was devoted to the Soviet cause and might be used to approach Robert Oppenheimer. But a month, labor, a month later, Moscow Center, the KGB headquarters, waved Heifetz away from Oppenheimer explaining that the KGB's sister agency, Soviet Military Intelligence, the GRU, had been cultivating Oppenheimer since June 1942, and consequently the KGB should leave him to the GRU. Cultivating was a Soviet intelligence uh, term, meaning that the agency was gathering information about and attempting to approach the target, generally through a friend or associate, with the ultimate outcome being a decision to attempt recruitment or not, depending on what the cultivation showed. Now, as we know from uh, Greg Herkin's remarks, the GRU run at Oppenheimer through Hakan Chevalier failed when Oppenheimer brushed off the approach and reported it, albeit belatedly and in several different versions, to Army security and the FBI. After the GRU's failure, the KGB took up the case. In mid-1944, in response to KGB complaints of having GRU and KGB simultaneously attack Enormous, um, as the KGB uh, named the Atomic Espionage Project, that this was duplicating efforts, and the KGB explicitly cited um, Oppenheimer as example of such duplication, KGB gained primacy in atomic espionage. A July 1944 KG memo noted that the agency's officers in America were continuing to cultivate Oppenheimer. Notice this July 1944 memo has the KGB cultivating Oppenheimer. This means that as of mid-1944, not only had the GRU's approach in 43 failed, but the KGB was only in the preliminary stages of attempting to contact Oppenheimer. And as for the KGB's cultivation of Oppenheimer, it was, if anything, less successful than GRU. GRU at least had gotten to the point of a direct attempt at recruitment through Chevalier. The KGB never even got to that point. Various messages from KGB stations in the United States and KGB headquarters memos, all found in Vasilyev's notebooks, referred to the KGB attempting to get close to Oppenheimer through Marshak, we already mentioned it, Paul Nahim, a chemist working for Union Oil, a company in California and a good Oppenheimer friend, Olga Newman, the Russian-born wife of a Berkeley professor of mathematics. Not only do these documents indicate that none of these approaches got anywhere, they also show that well into 1944, the KGB didn't accurately understand Oppenheimer's position in the Manhattan Project. More than one KGB memo referred to Oppenheimer as directing the cyclotron project at Berkeley. In reality, Ernest Lawrence presided over the highly important cyclotron project, and Oppenheimer only consulted with Lawrence on cyclotron work. Nor is there any indication that the KGB understood until it developed direct contacts at Los Alamos in late 44 that Oppenheimer was the scientific director of the Los Alamos facility. The KGB headquarters had been unhappy with Heifetz's performance as San Francisco station chief for very good reason. In 1944, it recalled him to face a scathing assessment of his work, including his failure to actively cultivate any of the Berkeley scientists involved in the atomic project, which of course would have included Oppenheimer. 
His successor, Gregory Kasparov, was charged with making enormous a leading priority, specifically instructed to cultivate Robert Oppenheimer. But Kasparov was soon transferred to Mexico City and his successor instructed to focus on the upcoming founding meeting of the United Nations to be held in San Francisco. In any event, the San Francisco KGB station was a small one with only a few professional field officers and their non-professional American sources. The more, most robust KGB technical intelligence team worked out of New York uh, through the New York uh, Soviet consulate where senior field officers Leonid Klasnikov headed a semi-autonomous unit of seven professional KGB field officers dedicated to technical scientific intelligence. The bulk of KGB atomic intelligence was run out of this unit, chiefly by officers Anatoly Yatskov and Alexander Fiklosov. Yatskov managed two primary atomic sources, Klaus Fuchs and Theodore Hall, and used as intermediaries Harry Gold, Paul Nahim, and Byron Darling, a physicist at U.S. Rubber Company. Fiklosov handled atomic sources Russell McNutt and David Greenglass via Julius Rosenberg. When Moscow created this technical unit in November 1944, it instructed Klasnikov to use Darling to approach Nahim, a friend of Oppenheimer, and Joseph Weinberg, a former Oppenheimer graduate student, as possible vehicles for contact. Later reports to Moscow in the first half of 1945 stated that the Darling and Nahim approaches to Oppenheimer had been without success. In July 1945, KGB headquarters prepared a review of its technical intelligence in the Western United States. The report listed five leads who were being cultivated but had not yet been contacted directly and certainly had not been recruited. The Oppenheimer brothers were, on both, of, were both on this list as targets to be pursued. Reflecting the KGB's continuing lack of close contact with Oppenheimer, it once again incorrectly identified him as director of the cyclotron. A later Moscow KGB plan for atomic espionage in the United States again listed the Oppenheimer brothers as targets to be pursued, not as recruited sources or even as prospects with whom contact had been made. In October 1945, the KGB in independently heard from two of its sources, Joseph Weinberg, uh, who we discussed before, and Charles Kramer. Kramer was a congressional staffer. Uh, both had the same um, information. They conveyed to the KGB the unwelcome news that Oppenheimer's political views had substantially shifted away from a communist perspective. At some point after this, Moscow Center appears to have accepted that its once high hopes of an ideological recruitment of Robin Oppenheimer had become unrealistic. In February 1950, after the arrest of Klaus Fuchs in Britain, a senior KGB officer prepared a plan of steps for the KGB to uh, take to, under, uh, to minimize the damage to KGB operation uh, by Fuchs confession. Among the proposals in the plans was, quote, finding ways to discredit certain leading reactionary scientists working on the atomic problem in the USA and England. It listed among the reactionary scientists to be identified as targets to be smeared was Robert Oppenheimer. Now the totality of the evidence from uh, FBI investigative files, from Army security files, from Venona, and from Alexander Vasiliev's notebooks, uh, and from other sources indicate that Oppenhe Robert Oppenheimer never cooperated with Soviet intelligence. The evidence indicates that the KGB failed even to make contact with him and the one contact GRU made, the Chevalier incident, was brushed off and reported to American security. However, it does appear more likely that in the fall of 1941, Oppenheimer gave Steve Nelson, a senior official of the local Communist Party, a cursory description of the atomic program. While this was irresponsible, Given the preliminary status of the program at the time, and that this was prior to his formally joining the atomic program in April 1942, to call this espionage is to overstate what happened. Oppen, uh, 
Oppenheimer's impropriety with Nelson and, and his belated report of the Chevet incident, however, also indicated indicates of his reluctant and on several occasions deceptive cooperation with American security. Oppenheimer's multiple versions of the Chevalier incident make it impossible to say exactly which one was the most accurate. And while Oppenheimer required his graduate students to promise to give up the com communist activity, most of them didn't, by the way, uh, when he hired them for bomb-related uh, projects, uh, but in the wake of Joseph Weinberg's turning over of Manhattan Project technical information to Steve Nelson, uh, that was when he reported the Chevalier incident and reluctantly provided Army security with some information on his students. When Army security forced his communist-linked students out of the Manhattan Project, he did not attempt to save them. Oppenheimer's shift toward greater cooperation with Manhattan Project security grudging and partial though it was, may reflect his own growing realization of the seriousness of what was involved and the responsibility he had assumed by his leading role in the Manhattan Project and his own evolution away from communism. But while new evidence that has appeared since 1990 shows that Oppenheimer was not a spy, certainly it appears clear to me that it shows he was in fact a member of the Communist Party. Now, Greg Herkin's book, The Brotherhood of the Bomb, supplemented by uh, new evidence on, uh, on Greg's uh, website, brotherhoodofthebomb.com, uh, covers most of the evidence of Oppenheimer's membership in the Communist Party. The only thing that I would add is the references in KGB archival documents dealing with uh, the atomic intelligence, which I've discussed earlier. Oppenheimer is repeatedly identified as a candidate for recruitment, largely on the basis of his Communist Party membership. How did the KGB know that he was a party member? Well, that's very easy. The Communist Party of the United States had senior level liaisons with Soviet intelligence who told the KGB who was and who was not a member. Let me quote from one of these documents, a 1944 Moscow uh, KGB headquarters report on atomic intelligence from February 1944. Quote, we should consider it essential to cultivate the following people. Robert Eimenheimer, secret member of the fellow countryman organization. Fellow countryman is uh, organization is KGB jargon for the American Communist Party. In view of his special significance and importance of his work Oppenheimer is supposedly kept under special security, and as a result, the fellow countryman organization received orders from its center to break off relations with Oppenheimer to avoid his exposure. The fact that he is a fellow countryman, as well as his friendly attitude toward our country, gives us reason to expect his cultivation will yield positive results. Now, of course, as we know, it did not yield positive results. Uh, the evidence is that in early 1942, 1942, Oppenheimer dropped out of the Communist Party. Because Oppenheimer's membership was secret and he never spoke candidly on the matter, it is difficult to pinpoint exactly when he joined and say exactly when he left. We also have little to go on about what motivated Oppenheimer's abandonment of communism. He could have dropped out in 42 for up you know, opportunistic professional reasons in order to make it easier for him to participate in the Manhattan Project. But, you know, people do change. By, uh, after World War II, his stance on key Cold War issues was totally incompatible with someone with, who was close to the communist movement. His ideological preferences had changed over time. The only thing I would add in closing is that in evaluating something such as um, Oppenheimer's security clearance, it's one thing to know what we know now, which is he never cooperated with uh, Soviet espionage and brushed off those contacts that, which were made. And it is another thing to know what security officials and the AEC knew in 1954. They knew a lot less than we know now. And one may think what they did in 54 was reasonable or not. Looking back on it with what we know now, the country would have been better off had his security clearance uh, been extended. 
but that is a after the fact um, judgment. Thank you. <laughs> Jim Fitzpatrick uh, will now speak on the issue of uh, uh, Oppenheimer's uh, security clearance and attempts to restore it. Is this all? Everybody can hear okay? Okay. Uh, first, uh, thanks to uh, Ellen and Valerie uh, for putting this together. I think none of us uh, knew that at this late moment, oh, thank you, thank you, kid. None of us knew at this l late moment uh, a subject uh, 50 years old would draw such uh, a crowd. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to talk about is a rather narrow issue in comparison to what some of our other speakers uh, have, uh, have discussed. Uh, I want to look at the issue whether one, uh, look at the context of the 1954 hearing and determine whether there was a reasonable basis today to try to overturn it. How this all happened <coughs> was that I was approached in my law firm, Arnold and Porter, a Washington law firm, to take a look for the JRO Memorial Committee in Los Alamos, whether one could bring a lawsuit to overturn the findings uh, that led to the loss of Oppenheimer's uh, security clearance. We uh, took this on pro bono, and I had upwards of a dozen Arnold and Porter lawyers that worked on tracking down virtually every uh, issue that we could identify that might bear upon a sensible challenge an attack, and we had uh, on our team uh, some people who had security experience. Jeff Smith, who is the former general counsel of the uh, uh, CIA, Ron Lee, who was general counsel of Homeland Security, and a whole bevy of young lawyers who found uh, pursuing uh, research in this area was a hell of a lot more interesting than uh, sorting through dozens of documents uh, in, uh, in discovery. Uh, some of you who are lawyers or have kids uh, that are lawyers know uh, that a lot of times uh, big, big city lawyering ain't all that uh, wonderful and can be uh, boring as hell. Uh, <laughs> we wrote a detailed uh, analysis, reaction of our views uh, as to whether a lawsuit uh, could be brought. After uh, 70, after uh, decades, uh, after the 1954 decision. And that uh, analysis, and what I want to talk about, is basically a lawyer's analysis that's different than a historian's analysis. Uh, and indeed, uh, I have uh, looked at a number of the books on Oppenheimer that are very thoughtful and come to uh, powerful, thoughtful conclusions. But those are different uh, conclusions that one has to draw if you are making a judgment can you actually prove something in court? That means you've got to have witnesses, you've got to go through a process of examination and cross-examination, and that process is markedly different than the respected process that a, a historian goes through. They read, think, analyze, and make judgments. 
their judgments uh, don't go to a courtroom normally. Uh, their judgments basically uh, are, if they're going to be questioned or supported, that'll come, come from colleagues who will be saying that that, that is ag uh, absolutely right. Greg's right on that point. John's right uh, on that point. The, the session today was dubbed the rise and fall of Oppenheimer. And there are many of you here, I'm sure, that know a lot about the rise of Oppenheimer. Probably many of you here uh, might have been uh, colleagues or had uh, connections with the Manhattan Project. Uh, you're probably scientists uh, and physicists, which is well above my pay grade. What I've tried to do is look at the hearing and the proceedings to determine can I can we responsibly say uh, to this uh, Good Works organization in Los Alamos that they have a fighting chance to win a lawsuit? And we came to the conclusion with no great enthusiasm or joy that the answer was likely no, that the, the forum for correcting any mistakes of the Oppenheimer proceedings were political. Uh, they were either in the executive branch or the Congress, uh, and ultimately, and we'll come to that in a minute in a rather disappointing uh, final chapter here of what happened with DOE recently in the last 48 hours of the Obama administration. But our conclusion was uh, that uh, don't try uh, to bring a lawsuit. That's going to bring. That might be good for the soul, but it is not good in terms of the likely vindication, the likely setting aside of a proceeding uh, 60 years later. The, we all know about the glory days of Oppenheimer, and they uh, took us through uh, the Second World War. Uh, probably the highlight, or the, the, the physical manifestation of the respect that he held broadly uh, in, in America was that he made the cover of Time magazine uh, in the fall of 1948. That was a, uh, to have Henry Luce's blessing uh, was a, uh, a mark of uh, broad acceptance. Uh, that, from my perspective, one saw the end of the Second World War as a triumph of the scientists in our society. There was great admiration for what Oppenheimer and his colleagues had done, and there was a broad sense uh, that the scientists uh, had uh, an important role to play in the uh, political, the broad political life of our nation. That, uh, that perception was uh, shaken, uh, I think, uh, as a byproduct of the debate over the future of atomic, uh, and, uh, re atomic research and the development of the, the development of the bomb, the hydrogen bomb. Uh, clearly, um, Oppenheimer was one of those um, who thought uh, that enough already, we, we have the, the power of destruction and we need not more. Uh, he, he talked about the, the fact that 
the questions about further development of the bomb, of the hydrogen bomb, went really to the morality of one society. And those were decisions that could not properly be made in secrecy. One of the debates was, at this point, uh, how open should the research be about the next step? And he was uh, a very powerful moral force uh, saying uh, that one needs this to be a matter of a broad public debate as to what uh, should be our research and what should be our goals because the, the ultimate uh, product here uh, was, could, could indeed threaten the whole concept of civilization. Uh, that was, uh, that whole debate um, in the late 40s and uh, into the 50s um, brought, uh, I think, a, a, a differing view simply because you had very powerful and respected scientists on the other side uh, from, from Oppenheimer, and Keller was one of those who wanted uh, full speed ahead um, we need to continue aggressively on a rush uh, schedule to develop, uh, to develop a bomb. You had in this period an increasing debate within uh, the scientific community that many of you here probably uh, have much greater firsthand uh, knowledge of. But ultimately, this uh, period of the late 40s and early 50s coincided with the period of McCarthy and the sense that there was a communist around every corner. And uh, the, is there any reason to believe that uh, that corner doesn't uh, uh, block off scientists as well uh, as, as all the others? In, go in government service. There, there simply wasn't a strong counterforce until we came into the late, 19, uh, late uh, 1950s uh, after Joe Welsh squelched uh, McCarthy in, in the hearings. There wasn't a strong popular counterforce. You had, uh, with Oppenheimer, uh, suspicions uh, of J. Edgar Hoover uh, from, the er from the early 1940s about, about uh, Oppenheimer's uh, communist associations. And as, uh, as Greg has indicated, uh, there, there were a lot of connections. And from the point of view of uh, 2010, uh, an understanding of what was happening in the 1930s and the issue of the morality of uh, opting to the left rather than to the right uh, is, uh, is much more, uh, is much more uh, understandable. These, uh, well, I was gonna say that Hoover from the very beginning was uh, on Oppenheimer's tail. Uh, they tapped his phones, they opened his mail, they put uh, secret li listening devices uh, in his, uh, uh, where he might be working. And unfortunately, none of that was a clear cut uh, violation of uh, unreasonable search and seizure at that point. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, 40s and 50s, so you you had building up uh, with the FBI and the security officials a very strong skepticism and concern. That was joined later with Eisenhower and the appointment of Louis Strauss uh, as the head of the S of the AEC. Straws was 
Straws entered into an informal relationship with Hoover, which make, makes one's blood boil when you think about their collaboration in the Oppenheimer hearings. Among other things, Hoover would Hoover was tapping the phones of Oppenheimer uh, and his lawyer. And that, from a lawyer's point of view, is just about as bad as it gets. The material went from uh, the FBI to Straws, and then uh, on 200 and plus occasions, I think Valerie in her presentation said, there were 250 intercepts of conversations between Oppenheimer and his lawyer, which from a lawyer's point of view, that is the most sacrosanct part of a communication. You simply don't, uh, you have no right to access uh, to, that, to that conversation. But that was one of uh, a series of decisions in the hearings uh, that uh, were made. There were basically two hearings. The first time around was a three-person uh, three panel led uh, by Gordon Gray, who was the uh, president of the University of North Carolina and uh, the former secretary of the, of, the, of the Army, a distinguished citizen. He picked, uh, uh, Straws picked the second member, who was the president of Sperry, and they picked a third person who was a chemist, a retired chemist from Loyola University. Those hearings went, as was noted, for uh, through the period of February into March uh, of 1954. And Oppenheimer uh, was on the stand for 27 hours. Uh, the way, uh, at least Marty Sherwin reads the transcripts, uh, Oppenheimer ran out of gas. He was physically and emotionally exhausted uh, as one went through the, uh, went through the hearings. And as uh, Greg has, has indicated, the, uh, the Chevalier event uh, was one of the seminal moments uh, where it became clear that would have been a nothing burger had Oppenheimer not gone through this period, at least in my judgment, gone through this series of uh, dissembling and inconsistent statements uh, about, uh, about what had actually happened with Chevalier. Ultimately, uh, the prosecuting, the attorney for the uh, AEC here was a uh, tiger, a litigation tiger by the name of Roger Robb, who ultimately became a, a judge in Washington and quite disingenuously uh, denied uh, some of his uh, participation in uh, what was really a, a, a well-conceived plot uh, by the people who were running this proceeding to ensure that Oppenheimer lost. Uh, Rob uh, had, Rob took Oppenheimer apart he just destroyed him in cross-examination uh, on these various stories. One person was approached, three people were approached, we won't tell who it is, it was X. And at one point, um, he got uh, Oppenheimer to uh, acknowledge that he had uh, been involved with a tissue of lies uh, in his first uh, description of Chevalier who, who what came out in the hearing was not this in-depth material that, uh, that we've heard that has come up uh, with uh, the readings of some Russian files, but what, uh, what came up was that there was a request which Oppenheimer, and I don't think anybody has found this, uh, has come to a different conclusion, 
Oppenheimer said, no dice, get out of here. I'm not going to provide information to uh, the Soviet Council in San Francisco. That was what the hearing, uh, that's what, uh, what the hearing says. The, the next step uh, the, in, the, in the hearing after uh, Oppenheimer acknowledged that he had been engaged in a cock and bull story and that he was an idiot and he had lied, uh, the prosecution was happy enough to rest there. Um, and you had, after that really damning cross-examination, you had some uh, testimony from both Keller uh, and from Ernest Lawrence and from General Groves, all of whom uh, were uh, negative. Uh, and it was read, the, the testimony of, of Keller, which was absolutely devastating, that he would have felt better uh, that secrets were in other hands rather than Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer put on a, a, rub, a rebuttal um, involving uh, some uh, very <coughs> famous uh, uh, public servants, um, Robbie, Vannevar Bush, uh, George Kennan, <coughs> John J. McCloy. McCloy was at this time in the 1950s, uh, the uh, Esquire magazine did a picture of the most important people in America. And John J. McCloy was the centerpiece of the entire uh, Esquire view of uh, who's important in America. He, he testified, uh, they uh, pulled together a very impressive character panel, uh, but all to no avail because two to one, the panel came down and uh, found that uh, the associations that Oppenheimer had uh, and uh, his views on the hydrogen bomb made him un a person who could not be trusted uh, with secrets uh, that might come up uh, from uh, in, in his responsibilities. So a two to one Oppenheimer lost. There was an appeal taken to the full A and C and that was, uh, that was really again uh, a, a contrived ploy to keep Oppenheimer's lawyers away from the facts that they needed. Um, the Straws engineer, Straws decided that Oppenheimer's main lawyer, I got you, sorry, thank you, uh, that Oppenheimer's main lawyer uh, be denied a security clearance so he could not see any of the key documents in the case. And that was notwithstanding the fact that, uh, uh, that the lawyer had earlier been given a, uh, a security clearance uh, and but turned it down because his junior partner wasn't. That was one of a set of very uh, un outrageous uh, decisions that stacked the deck against. Uh, we looked at all of these factors and finally concluded for one reason or another because the way the law worked then, you couldn't challenge the factual findings or the legal findings of the procedure. That was totally in the hands of uh, the uh, AEC and you couldn't bring up a challenge, a due process challenge because the way the law sorted out uh, at that point. So ultimately we concluded that there was no uh, effective way to bring a lawsuit and you had to go to a political forum. I just want to refer to the fact, yeah, uh, I, I want to refer to the fact that um, there was a decision um, which uh, after Jeff Bingaman and Martin Heinrich had worked very hard uh, on DOE trying to rehabilitate uh, Oppenheimer, 
And what they did was they affirmed that, that there's no doubt that he was a loyal citizen, no doubt that he was a loyal citizen, but uh, that uh, what they did, they said nothing about the irregularities of the proceeding, and they said that they weighed their prize for Oppenheimer was going to take a current system of uh, scholarships uh, for graduate students to study uh, the atomic energy uh, process and name it after Oppenheimer, and that was going to be the honor, and that was the full, the full measure of recompense that came from this, uh, pr this proceeding, uh, which we had said was the place to the place to go and not to go to the courtroom. Uh, I think that with uh, the administrative proceedings over and with the political proceedings over, it's now left uh, to the historians. And from what we heard today, there's still a number of new facts uh, that came out, that are coming out, and it'll be part of the public realm. One last quick anecdote. Um, you, you have, uh, Straws uh, was really the badass guy in this proceeding. Uh, he ultimately got his comeuppance um, at the end of, in 1959. Uh, Eisenhower nominated him to be Secretary of Commerce, uh, and he wanted that very much because his mentor, Herbert Hoover, had a decade and a half earlier been Secretary of Commerce. This is a hugely contentious fight within the Senate, and it wasn't at all clear, it wasn't at all clear who, uh, whether uh, he was going to get the majority vote. It came to a vote on the Senate floor, and this is one of these magic moments in the Senate when everybody is there. The floor was just packed. I happened to be working that summer um, for a senator and was in uh, up above uh, watching the whole thing as the vote was taken. The vote was dead even. And they called out the names and the one person who wasn't known um, was the vote of Mar Margaret Chase Smith who is the wonderful senator from the state of Maine. Uh, Barry Goldwater was handling the floor event for, uh, 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 for Straws. And at this electric moment, uh, Margaret Chase Smith came onto the floor wearing, uh, in her suit, wearing a red rose, as she always did, and in a very firm voice uh, announced the gentle lady from Maine votes no. With that, Barry Goldwater, uh, who was a man of high emotion, slammed his fist down on his desk and yelled uh, that everybody in all the Senate chamber and outside could hear, God damn it, and stormed off uh, the floor. Uh, that was the end of Louis Straw's. <laughs> No, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. That, that was the end of Louis Straw's public career, and the Republic is safe. Thank you all very much. I want to say thank you to all the panelists. We have had a really good sense now of the rise and the tragic fall of Robert Oppenheimer. A couple things come to mind. Uh, it's very clear that the McCarthy period was full of fear and people's lives were destroyed. And, and we are in a period now, I would say, actually since 9-11, where fear, which is one of the most powerful motivations we know, is in, in again driving people uh, and driving wedges uh, between, uh, between people in this country. 
Uh, so this story that we're telling decades later after it told, it has resonance today. And I also found it, this is just my own comment, uh, deeply ironic that the most powerful weapon in the history of the world ever, you may have seen, of course, on the history of uh, the bombings of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 200,000 people were evaporated in a moment. So the most powerful weapon in the history of the world that was brought forward by the most democratic country in the history of the world has, in fact, no democratic controls on its use. And we are perhaps more aware of that today because of the impulsiveness of the president that we have, but it certainly started back in the Manhattan Project. The secrecy that surrounded it, uh, how it was construed, uh, the sense that uh, this was, it is such a powerful weapon and we will need it, in fact, if we, against the Soviet uh, enemy, we, the, those that make the decision need to make it quickly. So the legacy of that is today we have uh, really just one person, the president, I don't care what, it, what others might say or might, you, what, might read, it is not true that the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State can weigh in or provide counsel or whatever. It is one person who has that ability. And um, to me, that is deeply ironic and also terribly wrong. Uh, Congressman Ted Lieu of California has led uh, some recent legislation to try to make, have Congress step up. Uh, because if it's true that we're only going to use a nuclear weapon in a defensive posture, then perhaps we need to provide a more democratic process for its use. What we're going to do now is turn to you and your questions. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, well, just uh, Ellen reminded me oh. uh, that uh, today is August 8th, uh, which is two days after the anniversary of the Hiroshima bombing and one day before the, uh, the destruction of, of uh, Nagasaki. So um, we do not have a microphone for the audience, but if you have a question, please stand, state your question, make it succinct, do not give a long talk about what you think about <laughs> any of this, but just a question. So please stand and I will repeat it and then our panel will, yes sir, right here. The, the question was, with all the names, and you've heard a lot this evening, was there one person who was the driving force behind the hearing? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, probably I would, I would pick somebody, a name you don't recognize, William Borden, William Liskin Borden. William Borden was the executive secretary of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, which was the most important committee in Congress. And he was also a zealot, uh, a man without measure, and uh, he came to the conclusion that Robert Oppenheimer was a Soviet agent. And he wrote a letter to J. Edgar Hoover uh, in 1950, as I recall, November 1950, uh, a long letter listing all the associations Oppenheimer had, all the decisions he had made, and most importantly, listing the fact that Oppenheimer, when he was chairman of the General Advisory Committee, the head scientific committee of the Atomic Energy Commission advised strongly against proceeding with the hydrogen bomb. And William Borden, Edward Teller, uh, Louis Strauss were all members of what became known as the H-bomb lobby. So they wanted to make sure that Oppenheimer's influence was removed. And uh, of course, Hoover agreed with that. Yeah. Yes, sir, right here. Did, every, did everyone hear that? Do I, yeah, opera, um, opera. Uh, 
Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, uh, actually, Ellen and the folks here at La Fonda were nice enough to give me a ticket to the opera last night. And I, I had actually seen the opera when it first premiered in, in 2005, and it's pretty much the same. However, uh, the one thing, and, what I, and I reviewed it, actually, for Science Magazine. And, and my review then, I think, would be the same review now, which is one thing that they got. I thought it was a great performance and the rest of it. But one thing they, they didn't get right, I felt, was the jubilation that the scientists felt when the bomb worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doubts, for the most part, came later. And one of the major characters is Robert Wilson, for example. Robert Wilson was physically ill after he heard the casualty figures from, from, uh, from Hiroshima and, and others as well. But Isidore Robbie talked about Robert Oppenheimer's high noon strut after the bomb had gone off. Um, and, uh, and even Robert Wilson, um, celebrated the, the, uh, the, the technical perfection of this device that they had worked on for so long. Uh, the doubts came pretty quickly after, once the weapon was used. Well, the, mm -hmm. the, there also was some <clears throat> concern about, uh, in the opera, uh, this, the Faustian uh, reference as to whether that really was an accurate uh, reflection or whether that was Peter Sellers' dramatic uh, presentation of the issue. Also, uh, you saw it earlier, but you didn't see it with that many Indians and that many down, <laughs> downwinders. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yes, sir, over here. Well, Bor Boris Pash did not want Oppenheimer to be the scientific director of the Manhattan Project and told Groves that directly. And Groves said, I don't care, he's indispensable. Go, going ahead with the hydrogen bomb. Well, that, yeah, well, the question was, where did Robert Oppenheimer do his deepest thinking and reflection of whether to proceed? Well, to that particular question, uh, uh, Greg might have a better opinion. I just wanted to note that while there was debate in the United States about proceeding with the hydrogen bomb, there was absolutely no debate in the Soviet Union. Uh, as soon as they had the uh, uranium and plutonium bomb, they went full tilt to develop the hydrogen bomb. And their hydrogen weapon, unlike their atomic and plutonium weapons, uh, were based on their own work and not on um, espionage. Now, the Soviets did get some information about the uh, uh, hydrogen weapon from there are few spies who were left uh, because they lost most of the uh, after the end of the Manhattan Project. But um, had you you really have to keep this in mind. Had Oppenheimer got his way, the Soviets would have had the um, the uh, hydrogen bomb years ahead of the United States. That part they would have had information from us. No, they developed it on their own. Yep. Well, how? Just don't fill that out. If Oppenheimer had his way, they would have got it earlier. If Oppenheimer had had his way, we would not have developed the hydrogen weapon. But the Soviets were proceeding full tilt that entire period. Just to add a footnote to that, that uh, I mentioned the General Advisory Committee just, uh, recommendation against proceeding with the hydrogen bomb, that uh, Isidore Rabi and Enrico Fermi were also in that committee, and they wrote a, a special memorandum, basically an addendum to the recommendation uh, that called the hydrogen bomb an evil thing considered in any light and necessarily a weapon of genocide. And their argument was that, and this 
you know, this goes somewhat against John's argument, is that you could, you could not proceed with a hydrogen bomb in this country because any test that would lead to a hydrogen bomb, any element of that test would be detectable. And therefore, once we knew that the Soviets were making progress toward the hydrogen bomb, we could ramp up efforts as well. And I don't, I'm not enough of a scientist to, to say whether that's true or not, but Robbie believed it quite, uh, I interviewed Isidore Robbie on that issue, and, and he, was, uh, he was quite adamant. He said, unfortunately, they didn't explain that very well in the memo when, they, when it got to Truman. So one, or, one more question? Two more questions? Yes, sir? Yes? Go ahead. You can answer. Say what? You can answer. <laughs> but when uh, Rose had built the Pentagon ahead of time and under budget, and then he was in Washington, he met Dave, and he, was, he didn't like him. And so he set up his own security system. So, I don't know if you can hear me. So, they, the FBI could not get into Los Alamos building. They had to stay at La or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, not to complicate things too, but you know, we talked about two versions of the Chevalier incident that Oppenheimer gave. He actually gave a third version, which was to Groves in December of 1943. He told Groves that it was his brother Frank who was approached. Yeah. So, um, yeah. who knows? Yes, sir. Last question? Yeah, go ahead. Unless there's one more. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. The, que the, question, the question was Oppenheimer's objections to the hydrogen bomb were twofold, both of a technical nature as well as a moral nature, and asked to w perhaps which one won the day, or can you illuminate more? Who, can someone speak to that? Well, actually, you're exactly right that the, uh, the recommendation of the General Advisory Committee, there were two, the one that was written by Robbie and Fermi that, ra that called it a weapon of genocide, but the majority recommendation that came from Conant, uh, uh, James Conant, uh, but signed by Oppenheimer since he was the chair, but Conant wrote it, uh, was that there are practical reasons. The, you don't need... Uh, a hydrogen bomb because we the atomic bomb is destructive enough. To build a hydrogen bomb, you have to stop production of atomic bombs and divert energy and efforts at Los Alamos. Um, so there were technical reasons to do it, but that's not what was used against Oppenheimer in the hearing. That it was um, it was the GA the General Advisory Committee's recommendation on ethical principles, uh, not practical considerations. I want to say thank you to our panelists. I want to say thank you to Ellen Bradbury. And thank you to you for coming.